So good morning and uh, welcome to uh, HW Company's Fraud and Forensic Webinar Series. Uh, my name is Tony Lanaza, I'm principal at HW Company, CFB, which is a certified fraud examiner and the director of the HW Company's Fraud and Forensic Group. Uh, the, the person, the one person that will be doing most of the speaking and the, is the expert in cybersecurity and cyber fraud is Mike Schaffner. He is uh, HW Company's Chief Compliance and Security Officer. You'll hear from him in a few seconds here. Just going through a few items here. First, um, you know, for our last fraud webinar of the year, we wanted to um, get you know our clients' feedback on you know what they really wanted to hear about. And you know, overwhelmingly, we heard cybersecurity was really top of mind at this point. Um, and it's it's really no surprise. Um, as you'll see, as we kind of go through some of this information, that you know, cybersecurity, cyber fraud, has really significantly increased um, this year related to you know a lot of factors, obviously with the pandemic. So we'll get into that. Um, Mike's going to get into the details of a lot of that information and so forth as we as we dig into the details. Moving into some of the housekeeping information, so we are offering CPE. Uh, you have to answer the polling questions. We have four, four polling questions throughout the presentation today. Please answer those. You know, it is at times a little quirky with, uh, you know, what kind of screen mode you are in. So if, if you cannot answer the actual polling question, make sure you're out of full screen mode. Um, at times, um, we've heard some issues with that. So if you're out of full screen mode, uh, you should be able to definitely make sure to be able to answer those questions. So do that. And then at the end of the, uh, the session today, once you close out of the session, you should get a, a, a survey that pops up. Make sure to answer the survey, you know, provide some feedback, um, potentially if, if you want to provide some feedback, as well as at the end, um, there's just a, you just type your name in for the signature to get the, the CPE credit. So make sure you do all that for all of that. Questions today, you know, we do welcome questions throughout. Um, we like the interaction with with everyone. So if any questions come up, you know, please you know include them in the question box in GoToWebinar, and we will review those as we move forward here in the presentation and try to answer them as we move move into it. So again, we definitely welcome questions. Please bring please provide questions as you can, and we'll answer the answer those as we go. Um, HW Company. And we have a really nice resource center on our website. We have mentioned this previously, a lot of good information, a lot of good articles specific to COVID-19 and you know, the CARES Act and a lot of things that have come up this year. Uh, the one thing you can do, if you don't get eBlast through HW Company, you can sign up for eBlast. Um, we've been, been providing some really good information and timely information out to everyone. So you can sign up there directly online. Um, also, lastly here, um, the webinar today is going to be recorded, so if you do have anyone that can't um, listen in on the on the live session here right now, you can um, have uh, have availability for that re uh, recording on our website through the Knowledge Center. The next slide here relates to a, a survey I just wanted to talk about before Mike gets into the details. Um, it's a survey that was provided by the Association of Cert Certified Fraud Examiners. And it's a benchmarking report related to, you know, the kind of like the fraud in the wake of COVID-19. And it was issued in September. This is actually the second survey this year issued in September of 2020. And it surveyed um, CFEs and what they're seeing out in the market, out in the, in the environment right now, just related to the pandemic and specific to fraud. And you can see just some of the, some of the numbers here, some of the statistics, you know, overall fraud, 77% you know, observed an increase in overall fraud. 92% expect a further increase going into 2021, um, as well as just overall fraud. And then just with just specific, specifically to cyber fraud, that that is the most heightened risk right now, which is cyber fraud. And you can see the numbers there: 83 83% observed an increase overall in cyber fraud, and 90% expect a further increase. So I just wanted to throw those numbers out there just so everyone's aware that you know really this is not going away. You know, they we see increases in just overall fraud, specifically cyber fraud, 
And you know, as we talk about some of the issues, the threats, and how to respond to those threats, you know, really your businesses, you individually should be thinking about what you can do now to you know really safeguard yourself and your business overall going forward with this with these threats. Um, and you know, we'll talk a lot more about this as we get into the more of the details. And with that, Mike, if you want to jump into uh, your part here. Sure. Thank you, Tony. What we're going to kind of organize here is some of the topics we're going to cover today are just kind of generic. What is cybersecurity in general? What does it mean? Why is it around? How does it apply to things? We'll get into some specific cybersecurity risks, what some of the things that can go wrong are. Then we'll talk about what happens if stuff does go wrong. What are what happens when there's lapses in cybersecurity? One of the big things this year has been obviously the huge increase in working remotely and what has that done to the whole cybersecurity landscape, the whole set of risks and concepts and things like that. We'll talk a lot about what to do to mitigate some of the threats, what common sense approaches can be taken, what kind of policy changes, where we can do the easiest stuff to try to make sure we don't have problems with cybersecurity in general. We'll also talk a little bit about risk assessments so that we can tell where, how is our business positioned to be able to defend against cyber fraud. We'll touch on insurance and what Ohio's safe harbor law can do for people, what kind of like, you know, literally security blanket those can be, what kind of incident and breach response needs to be in place so that if something does go wrong, how are you gonna know and what are you gonna do once the bad stuff does happen? We'll have some pretty simple takeaway action items at the very end that kind of be stuff that you could do like today to try to make the, your cybersecurity better, as well as at the end, if we have any leftover questions or answers, we'll go through things like that. So let's to start ourselves off here. Let's go ahead and do our first polling question so we can keep the CPE credit things happy. First question is pretty simple. Do you allow remote access to your system and it, you know kind of simple answers with yes no or only certain people are allowed to access things we'll leave the poll open for a few more seconds here to give people a chance remember these are required for cpe purposes leave it about 10 more seconds here Okay, it looks like from the results that we've got 25% said yes, anybody can answer, can access rather, and 68% of the people have reduced access, whereas a pretty small minority of only 8% have no access at all. Fairly typical answers there, nothing, nothing surprising. The good thing to see is that the majority is yes, but only certain employees, so it's not quite a free for all. Some cybersecurity concepts to talk about are wh why are we doing this at all? And it's pretty much, it's all about control. We want to control who's got access to the systems that are in use. We want to keep track of what kind of hardware, what kind of computers, what kind of devices are used with all the systems that are on in active use day to day. And we need to be concerned about the movement and storage of all the data that's being used because that's really the crux of what needs to be protected. We need to be able to monitor activities so we can tell if something goes wrong. It doesn't do any good to have all the theoretical stuff if you're not really keeping track of what's going on day to day. We obviously don't live in a static world. We've seen that hugely change this year and we need to be able to react to changes. Our cybersecurity plans and activities and everything else have to be able to change as the business needs change. That can be dramatic as we're seeing this year, or it could be as simple as you move into a new building, you need to make sure you react to different changes. One of the big things that needs to be in place that kind of ties everything together is a set of written information security policies. This is kind of like the, the, the operating manual, if you will, for your organization that says, yes, I'm committed to security, 
I have a plan to make sure it's in place. I have a way to monitor to make sure it's being complied with. And I have a way to show that I'm actually reacting to changes and making things better as time goes on. Yeah, one thing I wanted to kind of point at here, as Mike mentioned, is the reaction to changes. As Mike was saying, obviously, that you know this year uh, has been a, obviously a very, very different year. Lots of changes. You know, that's very important currently, you know, with with processes and personnel and an environment that have changed and, or have shifted. You know, a lot of business offices have, have changed the way they're doing things, you know, especially, you know, if there's layoffs or furloughs and all this remote work occurring in, in 2020. So, you know, we'll talk about that more as we move into, into this. But, um, you know, I think as a business, you know, you really... Uh, you have a due diligence to look at those processes, how they changed, and you know respond to those so you can minimize the risk overall. So, and we'll talk more about that at this point. But that's something I wanted to kind of hone in on this. Thanks, Mike. Obviously, for cybersecurity risks, it's all about who can touch the systems and the data. And it's almost as if there's two kind of distinct outside set of groups here one is truly outsiders people who are not part of the organization and then employees who obviously should be accessing information and should have the means and the ability to do that and we need to worry about two different kinds of access physical access as well as electronic access people tend to think of cybersecurity; they think oh it's all about the internet and electronics and email and everything else but there's also physical things in place that Obviously, you don't leave your front door open so somebody can walk in and steal a laptop off of a conference room table. That's just as disastrous as somebody hacking into the network. And in fact, it could be more so because once they have the laptop, the hard work is done in most cases, that if you're not protected and that laptop is not secured, that's worse than having an electronic breach of information. Even though it's the same kind of access for employees versus outsiders, the parts that are in place to protect things are going to be completely different for those two different classes of people because if somebody's outside we obviously want to completely put a hard stop on anything they could be doing whereas employees we need to be able to let some in and as we saw in that first polling question it is truly a sum in because we don't want to create a free-for-all where anybody can have access we want to make sure it's tied to their job duties and job functions so that it's easier to maintain. Some of the things that obviously can happen when things go wrong is if we have a lapse of cybersecurity, it's not just the fact that somebody may have our data, but obviously there's, you know, reputation hits. There's could be litigation. People could be, you know, sued over the fact you you let their information out into the wild. There could be fines from regulatory agencies major disruption of business everybody's seen recently the ransomware attacks that have shut down places even whole cities for sometimes months on end as well as once you've kind of fallen into this trap and have had an issue you're liable to be subject to future enhanced audits and scrutiny from everything from your insurance company all the way up to federal regulators if it's a hipaa thing with healthcare, or it might be something with the ftc the trade commission once you're on people's radar as having had a problem, that just doesn't bode well for potentially having to keep going in the future with much more enhanced scrutiny. And and, and I think sometimes too that that reputation loss, the first item there, is kind of overlooked at business for businesses and also individuals. You know, I think reputation, you know, public relations loss is huge for all businesses especially nonprofits, you know, where there's trust, you know, the trust is very key between the business, stakeholders and donors, um, you know, outsiders that either, you know, they purchase products or receive services or donate to non nonprofits. They really, they want to associate themselves with good, ethical, secure businesses, right? And if there's issues like cyber, cyber fraud or really any other fraud, that comes out to the public and you know business or businesses and other individuals that work with companies see that obviously that's reducing that trust overall so again you know that's obviously something that could happen 
after the fact where there's after a cyber fraud occurs. So you really want to prevent it or try to reduce the risk overall in, in the prevention of it in the beginning so you don't have to scramble in the end and try to, uh, try to fix things once um, things have occurred. So I so just wanted to mention that. Now, there is one question that came, came out. Um, when, when, when will the recording be available online? I, probably within a couple of days, maybe even tomorrow. So I would just check in. Um, on the website um, tomorrow at some point, and I would think that it would be available. If not, then I would check in on Friday. Then, but it should be available in the next couple of days. Looking at what changed with the whole pushing of the workforce to remote, obviously remote connections to systems that may have been only used occasionally in the past are now in use 24/7 by a lot more people than would have been doing them a year ago. There may be situations where due to the change in economics, a lot of people may have been laid off. So there may be a whole lot of disgruntled employees that maybe used to have connections to systems, but now all of a sudden have had to been let go, furloughed or whatever, and might not be so happy about it. Moving everything remote, obviously physical access to equipment has changed either because maybe there's nobody in the office and is anybody checking to make sure is there an alarm system in place, is the equipment still where we left it? But almost worse, if you will, on one hand, is everything physically moved remotely. So now instead of being inside your four walls with your own door lock and your own security system, you've now got equipment out in 25 separate locations and it's everything from one room efficiency apartments to parents' houses to your own house. Is that as secure as you were in the physical office? The duration of working remotely also comes into play because at the very beginning of all this, a lot of people had no concept that this would be almost you know, eight, nine months in now and we're still got some way to go probably before remote access backs back down again. Somebody may have decided the first 30 days, well, this is going to be quick. We could get by with this. It's not a big deal. Now, all of a sudden, we're looking at what may be a much more, obviously, a longer duration, and we need things in place that are going to be more permanent and not just a quick fix. One of the other big issues is obviously with everybody spread out, there's not nearly as much supervision as there was when we were inside off office space. Yeah, as Mike's saying, you know, as everyone went remote, you know, let much much less oversight. Uh, you know, someone's not really looking over your shoulder anymore. Um, you know, you know what we do as auditors. You know, one of the things we do as auditors is we we're required to look at journal entries, manual journal journal entries, while we're uh, conducting an audit. And the one of the tests that we actually perform potentially with that requirement is we look at individuals that post manual entries on weekends, right? So you think about it. Well, why do we do that? And you know the main reason is well, you know it's 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 a heightened risk with people on weekends because there's no one else around. Um, so it increases the risk overall, potentially with that that person, um, you know, having an ability and an opportunity to commit fraud because there's no one really looking over their shoulder. So, you know, getting back to what Mike was saying, you know, really understanding, um, you know, the processes, how they changed, and making sure that that supervision, that oversight, is still there, albeit maybe electronic or something else. You know, it's still there where you know that the 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 you know business office person, the accountant, the bookkeeper, is um, still perceives that there is someone overseeing them. Some of the other issues with remote, obviously, were who we've been talking about here. How did the security policies in general change? Were they adapted to deal with the whole new landscape and environment? Personal equipment coming into play. Are people using their own personal laptops or home desktops, home phones, instead of using corporate equipment. Things like password rules, Windows updates, antivirus updates, were those all controlled by a corporate entity 
but now someone's at home on their personal equipment, is any of that still in place? All of these things need to be watched and adapted to make sure that all of a sudden these things don't fall apart. It's gonna bring us to our second polling question that does your organization have a password policy? And I'm hoping this one comes back with a much higher percentage, hopefully on the answer that I would anticipate everybody gives. Give it a couple more seconds here. And it does look like, as you can see, overwhelmingly 95% of people say they do have a password policy, only 5% say no. And I would hope on the ones who said no, there really is some kind of a policy, they just don't think of it as being a formal written policy, but that there has to be a password in place on things. Kind of something to make you stop and think a little bit about is what, you know, what could these things happen to you? And the answer is obviously yes for all of these. Everybody uses email these days. There's no getting away from it. We just talked a little bit about password hacking. There's always the chance somebody's trying to guess your password. Things like wire fraud and embezzlement, you might not think too much about right off the bat, but a lot of times that can come from the whole remote section where, again, little lack of control. Some of the internal controls are more lax potentially with the remote use. If a bad email comes through requesting transfer of funds, all of a sudden that turns into wire fraud. Stolen equipment obviously can become a big thing. We've got, you know, potentially 25, 30, 40 computers out in the wild, if you will, that aren't under the direct control of our four locked office doors, if you will. So all of these things can come into play and wreak havoc, if you will, if the policies have not adapted and are not being monitored. One we, kind of quick, we, quickly, ahead, Mike, Tony. one of the things too is, you know, there, we still see so many examples of this, even in our client base, you know, with those those issues, you know, the wire fraud, email phishing, you know, um, you know, I've heard, you know, lots of clients going through, and I'm sure you've read them or you've experienced them yourself with, you know, you're getting an email, that you know, it looks like it's coming from a CEO, your president, or the owner, or somebody at a high level where you typically get emails from, and it, it, it asks, um, you know, can you can you wire you know two hundred fifty thousand dollars to this account? And we need to do it ASAP. Um, you know, maybe typically you do some wires here or there, you know, a couple times a month, or maybe a few more, maybe not as much. Um, again, you know, you're in a remote location, you don't have you can't walk down to their office and ask. So, you know, you you end up just doing it because it looks legitimate, right? And this has happened to a lot of us. Um, you know, what I tell my clients is, you know, really, and we'll talk about education, but that's very key on, on educating your employees on this is maybe you just, you tell your, you tell the person, whenever you get an email like that, just, you know, pick up the phone and call me or text me and ask me, hey, is this a really legitimate wire um, request? And should I do this? Just so you really you know, doing that really eliminates the issue completely, right? Um, and then you can deal with you know how this person got in got access later on and deal with the IT side of it. But you know really again prevention is key. And this kind of, in this case preventing it is really probably just asking. Really, if you're if you're at a different location, probably sending a text or a, or a, a quick phone call would would suffice to really reduce that. To, uh, to a very minimal level. Thanks, Tony. A, a couple little quick statistics on email phishing that 4% of people are gonna click on it, kind of no matter what you do, that's been the standard. The good news is 78% of the people will probably never click. There is a little bit of re you know, the reoffending people, if you will. Once somebody's clicked on one, they're 15% more likely to do it again. So that it's kind of the problem people, if you will, that need to keep being educated to try to reduce that to less than 4%. Only about 17% of phishing emails are ever reported. And typically, the first time somebody clicks on one is within 16 minutes. 
So it's not instantaneous, but it's pretty darn close. And if they are gonna click, it's usually within that first hour that they've received the email that somebody does actually do the click. And what that kind of signifies is since if these were only reported back to a IT person, a department head or something, you could quickly get out a follow-up email that says, hey, you see this email from Mike Schaffner, don't click on it, we think it's fake. And you've really only got about 16 minutes or so, certainly within an hour to get that done. Some of the ways to mitigate things that go wrong are multi-factor authentication. Everybody should have that turned on on everything you possibly can from your personal Gmail account to your bank account, to your login, to your network, any place it could possibly be used that should be turned on. It's the easiest way to prevent somebody who maybe gets a hold of your password from being able to do anything. Password rules, encryption, access restrictions, all of that will help if somebody's trying to break in. But the biggest thing to remember is once they get your password, that multi-factor authentication is going to be one of the only last things that will stop them. I listed employee education on here twice. And actually, employee education is so important because without reminding people, teaching them and educating them, people forget. People get busy until it becomes ingrained and becomes second nature. You have to keep educating people. We did just get a quick question in about asking if we recommend that all phishing emails are sent to IT. There's two kind of schools of thought there is sending it to IT is a good thing. Broadcasting it to the whole company saying, hey, I just got this email, don't click, is not necessarily good because people's curiosity gets the better of them and they might not have gotten it originally, but you just sent it to them and they may click on it anyway. So I would say to an IT department, yes, you should send it out. At the very least, send an email saying, hey, I got this from so-and-so. We don't think it's legit. Passwords, we talked about a little bit. If everybody had a password policy, hopefully everyone is following all of this. They're all unique. You don't share passwords. They're set to expire. So it, they, if somebody does get a hold of a password, they don't have it forever. There's some complexity involved so that 1234 is not your password. Biggest thing are the bottom two points where you want to make sure that users have access with that password to only things they need to. So it's access is defined by a job title or a function. And most importantly is that that access is turned off when somebody is terminated or has a job change. That maybe internally somebody used to work in the accounting area and they were in charge of entering all the invoices and posting items. And all of a sudden they had a rearrangement and they're only part-time now and they're now at the front desk most of the time and they're no longer in charge of doing anything with invoices. They really shouldn't still have that access. That access should be changed so that to make sure that they don't inadvertently lose their credentials and somebody gets in or they're tempted to go back in again when that's not their current job function. We talked a little bit about stolen equipment and encryption is basically your best get out of jail free card around for anything that can go wrong with data. If somebody steals a hard drive and it's encrypted, they can't do anything with it. Somebody steals a laptop, but it's encrypted. Again, there's nothing that they can do with it. So it's you don't have to report it as an event because they can't do anything. The one thing you have to be careful of is the encryption key has to be controlled and complex. If you encrypt the laptop with 1234 as the password, it's just as bad as your network password being 1234. That kind of doesn't count. That's not really encryption. We talked about, you know, kind of education, education, and education, and it's it, it's kind of a mantra that you just can't stop. There needs to be education on hire to make sure somebody knows what their expectations are, as well as what your company is doing with things like phishing emails, password access, locking the front door, all of those simple things. It needs to be ongoing reminder education. Not only is it just to refresh people's memory, but things do change. That maybe there's a new policy in place for how to log in. Maybe your second factor authentication has changed now, 
or maybe you're now just using it for your email, whereas before it was just your main network logins. It's again, back to everything needs to adapt. The bottom thing is reporting guidelines for strange things. That's back to the question about, should I send phishing emails to IT? People have to know what to do. A lot of people can use common sense and they might do the right thing, but if you've got it in writing, it's been educated, educationally talked about in your employee handbooks, in your onboarding, that way it makes things easier. You should also target your education by risk level. If you've got an employee that never uses a computer for some reason, you don't need to hit them quite as hard with what to do with logging into your corporate network. Phishing email education doesn't hurt because that works anywhere. It's that Those things apply to your home email address on your Gmail as well as it does at work. Email threats, basic stuff that everybody kind of thinks is common sense, but again, it never hurts to repeat it over and over and over again. You never want to open stuff from people you don't know. You don't want to respond to anything, even if it is to try to unsubscribe, because that's still a response and it lets someone know you're a valid email. Ideally, you don't want to access emails on the same computer that you do secure suspects things. In other words, if you've got one machine that's tied directly to your bank to initiate and approve payments, if you can not open email on that, all the better. Because if somebody does manage to compromise the computer, they can then do really bad things. Reporting suspicious, e suspicious emails we've talked about. One of the other statistics that's a little disheartening because we all do it and it's a day-to-day -day use in the business world is m almost half of malicious email attachments are regular old office files. Word documents, Excel documents, PDF documents. The problem here is you can't obviously just ban everything, so there has to be a way to go through and make sure things are safe and there's procedures in place to check things. Looking at emails, there are some simple common sense things you can educate people on that obviously sometimes you get them, they look like they're from a real irs.gov address. But when you look further into the email, you realize, wait a minute, this link I'm about to click on, it says the words internal revenue service, but that's not where it's going. You have to pay particular attention to links because you never know if that link is secure. You're much better off going directly to, in this case, if I really think this is real, to an IRS website and finding a link there rather than following things that are in email. Another example of where people try to spoof you is they misspell the email address. If you look quick at it, it looks like that's coming from Amazon, but there's no A in the ending there of amazoncanada.ca. A lot of times emails, if they're generic, they're not personalized, it's probably not really for you. Other down thing at the bottom is just because it looks like that's what the link says, if you hover your mouse over it, it'll show you where you're really gonna go, and that may not be what you're looking at. So you can't obviously take anything at face value. There has to be a way to scrutinize things the easiest way to do it is to look at the email address where you're headed to and find the first part of it and make sure that's legit. There may be a ton of stuff way off to the right of that because you're going down into deep pages, but you want to make sure it looks like, in this case, Amazon.com for real, whereas the bottom there in the red where that's really where it's going, that's not something you want to click on. Let's do a quick third polling question here that does your organization have written security policies? Is there a formal set of security policies in place that's followed that's kind of your Bible, if you will, for how your company deals with security? Give this a few seconds. Looks like we've got almost everybody has responded. And it does look like the vast majority, 80%, do have a written security policy, whereas 20% are saying no. And hopefully the 20% saying no, again, may have disjointed policies. They've got a stack of things that are followed. They just don't have it pretty, if you will, 
into something they're officially calling their written security policy. Mitigating threats, we've talked about some of this already, email filtering, you should have something in place to look for spam emails, malware, viruses. Everybody's heard of all the big companies, Norton, Sophos, Web Roots, all of those things. There should be something in place. Penetration tests are something you can have an outside firm come in and try to break into your network to see if they can spot holes that you could easily close. Doing risk assessments, looking at the organization as a whole and seeing are there places where we need to tighten things up? What could go wrong? Where are our biggest areas where we might have issues? Do we have security policies in place? And do we have that written information security policy to tie everything together? All of these make it easy to mitigate issues. One of the biggest things currently is with people working from home is device management. Do you have control over what's being allowed to touch your corporate information? Are there policies to uh, allow certain applications to be run? Is there encryptions on in, installed on cell phones and tablets? Password requirements, do you have timeouts on lock screens? Now that somebody's sitting at home on their dining room table with their corporate laptop open, you know that that's got a screensaver that's gonna kick on after 10 minutes so that nobody walking by can see what's on there. Is there a way to remotely wipe information if the inf if the computer does get stolen? Is there a way to sandbox the corporate data, which means can I keep that separate from the personal stuff that's on everybody's cell phone? All of these things are important that we need to make sure are in place now that we've kind of opened up our universe usually to devices that aren't necessarily governed by the same old corporate standards that used to be there. This written information security policy that I talked about has got a pretty formal big definition there, but it's really just the collection of everything that you're doing to make sure you keep information safe and secure. Sounds kind of daunting, but it really isn't that bad. It's simply the collection of everything. One of the things you can use to decide how to create one of these is a risk assessment. What that's gonna let you do is go through and see where do you stand right now with the with the current risks that may be facing your business, what has changed over time, how bad are some of those risks, what can you do about them, and then keep track of what you are doing and who's responsible for it. The risk assessment doesn't have to be a crazy formal thing, it's just something that's measurable, it's a way to rate the severity of a thing going on, and it needs to be simple answers. You can't have like narrative responses. Otherwise, it's too hard to tell, am I getting better? Am I getting worse? Is this really a risk that's been addressed? Or is it just a vague, oh yeah, we're sort of doing that. You need to have simple yes, no answers. One of the easy ways to do it is to literally do a quick little matrix of what's the likelihood of something happen? And if it does happen, how bad is it? And you may have things that are really low insignificant risks that never happen, all the way up to stuff that's almost certainly gonna happen, and it's a critical thing if it goes wrong. And these can be as simple as what if somebody loses a key to the front door, somebody has their password compromised, somebody loses a laptop, or somebody breaks in the window and you have a theft out of your conference room. It's fairly easy to go through and come up with a matrix like this. One of the ways to try to follow some of these things is to, you don't have to go it alone. There are a lot of resources out there that give you a benchmark, a framework, if you will, for what should you be looking at. NIST is from the, the feds and is a open source, if you will, free set of cybersecurity framework components that have done the heavy lifting for you. They've kind of thought of everything that could possibly go wrong and given you a checklist of, albeit 200 some items, but it lets you easily go through and go, oh, I never thought of that, or this doesn't apply to me, but it means you don't have to go it alone. You can rely on this framework to base all of your policies off of, and it gives you a lot more security as well as legitimacy to what you're doing. It's not just you saying that this is something I think is important. You can go back and go, no, this is kind of a federal standard that was developed. They're the ones saying it is either important or not important as it applies to my business. 
the NIST framework is divided into five simple areas of identifying items that needs to be protected, how are you gonna actually protect them, how do you know when something goes wrong, what are you gonna do when something goes wrong, and then how do you get back to normal? And they've made it that simple, and it applies to kind of any business. It's not specific to any given sector. It doesn't just do healthcare. It just doesn't do accounting. It just doesn't do nonprofits. It lets you tailor it to what your own specific business needs are. The actual framework itself is a little wordy in the sense that it comes from the Fed, so it's a little out there. But if you look at it from what it's actually asking, it's not nearly as daunting as it may seem. There's six things listed here that seem like they're really big, but yet the first one is simply, you know what computers and devices you have. Second one is, do you know what software you're using? Do you know where your data is actually kept and who gets it? What external stuff are you using? Do you, out and, do you go out and use QuickBooks on the web or is everything totally in-house? The fifth one down there, resources, do you have stuff that you really don't care about because it's simply a game that everybody plays in the office or is it truly the corporate books and records need to be kept somewhere secure? Then likewise, the last one is, do you simply have roles and responsibilities that are in place so that it's not a free for all, everybody can access everything? This framework allows you to kind of go through and you could very easily answer those six things. And that means you've kind of addressed all of those areas, even though your answer may just may be, yes, we, are, we, are, we go through and look at all of our computers every year. So there's sometimes a lot of complication in here. Other times it's fairly simple information. And I think here, you know, Mike, it has has assisted a number of our clients with trying to help them through this process with you know reviewing their policies and procedures um comparing it to the nist framework um you know it's very extensive as mike was saying but again you know, i think a lot of it doesn't apply and a lot of it does apply you kind of have to get through all of that sort of that minutia a little bit that doesn't apply to get to the really um you know the important stuff and if you look at if you look at that heat map you know you really what you do is it, it prioritizes some of the things that you really need to look at now um so it's not gonna if you have half the things that potentially you have risks at you're not gonna look at all of them at one time right you're gonna go through it and it's gonna take some time to go through everything so it's gonna prioritize it have you look at the the high level extreme items first correct those first, and then move into the other ones where maybe potentially the risk isn't as high. So um, you know, a good framework. And if, if again, if there's any any clients of ours out there that you know, have questions about it once they take a look at it or or anything like that, you, know, you can always um, contact us and we'll, we'll try to help you out. Big thing to remember about a risk assessment and all these policies in general is that it's not static. You're identifying issues, you're reviewing them, you're developing controls, you're evaluating the success of those controls, and it's never ending. And you may be doing that continually, you may do it quarterly, you may do it semi-annually, you should at least do it annually, again, just to make sure nothing new has happened and all your risk assessments are, they still mean something. They're not 10 years old and you don't even are in the same building anymore and you don't use the same software, you don't use the same computers that risk assessment doesn't do you much good. One of the other areas to keep track of is third-party security issues. If you are using Quicken up in the sky, if you will, how do you know Quicken's secure? Do you know that your, your Gmail provider is secure? Do you know whatever software you might be using, are they secure? One of the things you can get from any of the third parties, if they're serious about security, is this SOC report which is where they've had an independent company come in and say, here's what they're doing with security. Here's their risk assessment. Here's their stance on security policies. Because you obviously don't have time to go do it yourself. You can rely on reports like these. Yeah, and all, all businesses most likely use some sort of third party you know, assistance 
know, the SOC means service organization. So, you know, if you think about it, businesses using payroll, outside payroll companies, um, third party administrators, there's lots of, um, you know, a lot of, lots of businesses using different companies, you know, really contracting them out to help, you know, with, a, 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 you know, a certain item of the organization. So, again, if you, if you think about the payroll side of it, you know, are, are you, if you're using an ADP or a, or a Paychex or someone else, are you obtaining their SOC reports? Are you reviewing those SOC reports? Um, and, and just making sure that you know their controls on their end are appropriate based on what they're doing for you, right? For the for the user side, for your side. So you know, it's making sure that as a business, you're reviewing that those SOC reports, making sure that there's any, if there is any issues, you're addressing those issues, issues potentially. Um, and then and also another key to this whole thing is you know, these these SOC engagements, service organization control engagements. They include what they call as complementary controls, where in these reports it says that there there needs to be a policies or controls in place at the business because we do uh, you know we're not involved in that area or we we don't have access to it. So even looking at those complementary controls and making sure that your business is following those controls is very key as well. One of the other quick things we kind of mentioned at the very beginning here is some of the mitigation issues and where insurance really isn't a mitigation. It is something that can help you out, obviously, but there's a couple things you have to be careful of is what are your actual coverage limits? What are the policy details on how you actually invoke coverage? What do you have to do? Who do you have to notify? Who are you allowed to use for any forensic work that may need to be done? And what is the response plan for that particular insurance company? You call the agent, you call the company, do they have their own attorneys? Do they have their own computer experts? Are there definitions about what kind of coverage you might actually have that it may turn out that it's not your cyber coverage that would apply, it may be a crime coverage instead. It's always a good idea to make sure you've talked to the policy people, if you will, your agent, whoever's got those details and kind of looked at your risk assessment about what could go wrong, where am I covered? One of the big things that's gonna happen with cyber insurance is one of the first things they ask is, do you have information security policies? Are there tests done? Do the policies get updated when anything changes? This little snippet happens to be from our HW and company's cyber insurance application that the insurance company obviously is not just going to issue a policy without making sure that you actually have things in place to make sure you can mitigate any of the risk and any of the exposure. One of the other pieces that comes into play is Ohio has a safe harbor law that's two years old now, that if you have a written information security program in place, you can basically kind of take the stance of, hey, I did everything I could. Even though something bad happened, it wasn't like I had my head in the sand and was ignoring everything. There are some pretty specific requirements for this to come into play. Biggest one being, again, you have to have that written policy. It has to have pieces in it that protect the security, protects against all your risks, keeps track of any uh, unauthorized access or acquisition, as well as the scale of the program has to be, uh, has to match the complexity of your organization. You don't have to go out and spend $5 million and wall in the world, but you can't say that a $10 piece of antivirus software you're not gonna do because that's too expensive. So you have to make sure that the scale and the size and the scope all make sense. One of the other big things is your written security policy has to be following a framework that isn't something you just made up, if you will. We talked about the NIST. The easiest way to find information on the NIST framework is to honestly just Google NIST cybersecurity framework. There's a huge website the government runs that NIST runs that has all the ins and outs of that. There's a couple other sets of standard things, ISO 27000, the payment card industry, 
HIPAA has rules, the Gramm-Leach-Bliley Act has got certain rules. All of these are what can develop different standards that you can then base your written security policies on. When something does go wrong, and it inevitably will, you need to have a way to respond to that. And not everything that goes wrong results in a breach, but you need to have a way to figure that out. So there needs to be a written plan. It should be a kind of a checklist approach, so it's structured. You need to have thought of this stuff ahead of time. Who are you gonna talk to about it? Who inside your company needs to know? Who's got the authority to react to issues? And after the dust settles and you've got a chance to take a breath, you need to go back and re revisit your risk assessment and figure out, huh, how did this happen? What needs to change? As well as, now that we've been through this little whole incident nightmare, what didn't work? Turns out we don't have anybody's cell phone number, or all we have are cell phone numbers, or we don't have anybody's office number, or nobody's home number, or whatever might not have worked as well as it should have. You have to have some way to know if you're having a problem. Sometimes it's easy. Somebody stole the equipment. Other times it's not so easy. You maybe needed to look at your computer activity to see that why is Mike logging in at 2 a.m. in the morning when Mike doesn't work at 2 in the morning? Or why is Mike logged in twice, once from Asia and once from Ohio? Or why did I come in the front door at 2 in the morning when I'm normally not in the building? Or why am I in the file room and walking out with boxes? Or just general policy violations that we can see that people aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. And again, there has to be a way to know this. So is somebody looking at your computer logs or is somebody looking at failed login attempts that somebody tried to guess my password 10 times? Same thing with second factor authentications. Every time that second factor pops up on your phone, are you blindly just saying yes? Or are you stopping to think hopefully, wait a minute, I'm not doing that. Why is it asking me if this is me? Again, all part of the education, all part of the policies, all part of things that need to be done. A flowchart and a checklist aspect to this is needed because when this, when things go wrong, the last thing you're gonna have time to stop and think about is what am I supposed to be doing? These are two issues that are, are kind of HIPAA oriented, but they're checklists and flowcharts to use when things go wrong with a HIPAA breach, with a medical information breach. And the way they're designed is so that you don't have to stop and think. You need to answer five questions, six questions in a checklist, score up some points, and you can look at your range of scores and decide, oh, I can breathe a little sigh of relief, this isn't a disaster. Or I need to know, as I'm working through the flow chart on the left, who do I have to talk to? Who do I have to notify? What agency do I have to contact? All of that's very important. One of the things to remember is when something does go wrong, there could be a lot of people that have to be notified, not necessarily while it's ongoing and you're trying to stop it, but after the dust settles, what state agencies, how are you gonna tell your employees? What about company management? Do you have a board of directors, shareholders? How are you gonna tell your clients? Is there a media response that's needed? Have you talked to law enforcement? Do you even know what the local FBI number is? All of this needs to be done kind of ahead of time because when you're in the throes of things, you're not gonna have time to go figure this out. One of the other big things to remember is anytime data is involved, it's driven by the state or the residence, if you will, of the person whose data is compromised. So if you have a donor base and you've got people from all 50 states involved, you have to follow those 50 individual different states rules during any kind of a breach response. And that frankly is a nightmare because they're all different. But if you haven't done the homework ahead of time, you're liable not to be able to figure out what needs to be done when, let alone who's supposed to be doing it, that you can't be reactive, you need to be going through some kind of a checklist. Let's do a quick kind of last polling question here. Do people have cyber insurance? Hey Mike, while we're waiting here on the polling question, um, I think you answered this, but just to confirm it, the uh, NIST cybersecurity framework, where can you get that? The, 
honestly, the easiest way is to literally just Google NIST cybersecurity or NIST framework, and it will take you right to the NIST site. And they have educational materials, they have posters, they have more in-depth kind of analysis of how it was built and what it does than you'd ever want to do, ever want to look at. And on top of that, they do have the two to 300 page PDF that goes into all the gory details of why it was designed, how it was designed, that literally just Mr. Google is your friend there to be able to get right to that website. So it looks like on this poll, pretty good majority, 70% have got insurance and 21% aren't sure. It's not obviously a get all beat all, but yet it certainly can't hurt. The biggest thing I would wanna stress is to make sure you, you check what your coverage actually is and what you have to do when something goes wrong. Because the last thing you wanna do is have the pretty insurance policy in your desk drawer but come to find out, you have to notify your agent within 24 hours or the coverage doesn't apply. Or worse, you have to use their attorneys, if you will, and that's not free. Or you have to use cybersecurity company forensic examiner XYZ, and they're based out of Austin, Texas, and you have no way to get a hold of them, and you don't even know who they are. So again, you just got to make sure you don't use cyber insurance as your get out of jail free card without knowing what's behind it. That was a lot of information that we kind of crammed into a quick 50 minute discussion. We could spend an hour almost on each slide if we really wanted to. Some kind of quick takeaway items here of importance are can't stress education enough that we really, you really need to make sure people understand what's expected, what they can do, and how they go about doing it. Reviewing of a written information security policy, even if you don't have it in the pretty binder that's spiral bound with colored paper in it, make sure you've got password policies, make sure you're using multi-factor authentication, make sure you've got email controls in place. Risk assessment, anyone? Is any, if the people who haven't done it, don't have it formally done, make sure you at least start to tackle that process. Likewise, as I said just a second ago, make sure you review your insurance coverage. Feel free to email you know, Tony, myself directly, give us a call. More than happy to go into any more detail anybody needs. Anybody needs specific web links or things like that, we can obviously get those out to people. Thanks, Mike, appreciate all the information and the time that you put forth. Uh with putting together the, the slides and, and helping us, you know, everyone else, um, you know, really understand the cybersecurity and cyber fraud. Um, you know, thanks everyone for attending. Hopefully you took a, a couple things from the hour that you can implement. Um, and, and I think as Mike was saying, I think the education side is very important. And, you know, even doing it virtually would, would help right now as well. So thank you everyone. Um, I, I, you know, appreciate everyone's time and everyone have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.